Good evening. Okay, uh, let us pray. All right, Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and study your word. We ask that you uh, open up our hearts um, so that as we speak, may your words come and speak into our hearts and continue to transform us by the renewing of our mind. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right. So, hi, I'm uh, Aaron. Um, has been some time that uh, I stand here. Uh, I was telling my wife, I totally don't feel any nervousness. Until five minutes ago, I start to have palpitation of my heart. So I said, hey, what's happening? I thought I... All right. But uh, a bit of uh, background. Okay, I'm... Uh, for, for some people who may not know me, I'm a teacher by, tr by training. Uh, I teach physics in a secondary school. So I'm uh, in and out of class every single day. But of course, I won't treat you all like children today la, or teenagers, all right? And, but I was engineering trained, okay? I was trained as an engineer, but I, I did engineering for about a year and I gave up, decided to be a teacher of physics. Until today, still teaching physics. And um, I probably would have uh, gone very different path, all right? Uh, because when I was in, you know, when I went to university for the first time, I'm staying alone. Uh, my parents are not there. I was staying in a hostel. Wow, it's havoc, right? And those were the days where internet games first came into place. Uh, I went into uh, NTU and then they were distributing flyers. And they say, welcome to the biggest, biggest land shop in Singapore. I was like, wow, where? They say, anywhere in, in the university, is, you can just connect. You can play fast internet games. And those days... Uh, of course, not as fast, but were already very fast. I started playing internet games. So basically, I barely clear all my modules. All right? I, I did not fail a single one. I made sure I just can barely pass in order to make sure I get my degree. Lah, right? And we'll go and work. Okay, and then my third year, I went for an internship uh, quite, in quite a, by the grace of God in a quite a prestige uh, research institution for six months. Six months later, when I was about to leave, one of them came to me and said, hey, Aaron, we find you really suitable. We like your working ethics and we want to ask you, uh, want to offer you a direct PhD. I said, wow, okay, all right, now we are talking, right? So then he said, uh, the condition is you must get a first class honours, if not a second upper class honours, minimally, right? Second upper class. If not, um, too bad, we would not be able to, by our policy, we will not be able to help you with that. But we really hope you can do it. All right. And now, I went back and I said, I start to ask around, all right. I then start to ask around at my third year, hey, how to get second upper class honours? <laughs> you know, my friend asked, do you have A's? I said, no. Do you have B's? I said, barely. Do you have C's and D's? I said, a lot. I said, ah, you cannot. Uh. <laughs> sure cannot. Oh, then I began to realize, oh no, nobody has taught me. I've never given it a thought. I never thought that getting a good class honors may give me, bring me opportunity. I just uh, wasted my years, barely passed, you know, just leave a mediocre, average results will do. So from that day onwards, I studied super hard, all right? The library starts at 7, I'm there 6.45, only to find out that there is a queue outside the library. I begin to realize, oh, those scholars, right, overseas scholars, they're already queuing there. I better be begin to learn from them. Oh, and they went to the library, they chopped the single solo seat. I began to learn from them. They study until nine when the library closes. I also study nine, right? And then after nine, they still go from the libraries. They go to a canteen from round two until 11. Oh, I also try to be like them, but I cannot sustain, now, right? But then I get, hey, no A's, all B's. And I said, never mind, I try one more semester last year. I try one. Finally, I get all A's. Oh, I'm so happy. But guess what? Did I, did I get my second upper? No, la. if not, I won't be here. La. <laughs> okay, just kidding. Okay. But God knows. Huh? God knows me. Huh? I, looking back, I know I'm so big-headed. If I were to do it, I think I'll be even more big-headed. So God knows. But God taught me a very important lesson. Then I look back at my life. My, I realized I have not been setting targets at all in my life. Right? I just go with whatever is bare minimum and then that's it, all right? So God taught me a lesson. To everything you do, right, begin with an end in mind. So Stephen Covey had written this book, The Seven 
habits of the highly effective people. And the second habit, I won't go into all details, but it's begin with the end in mind. So as Christians, what is the end in our mind? That's very important. If not, we will live, we will easily fall into a trap of just living a mediocre life, chasing everything after everything, whatever flyers, people say play game, you play, people say do this, you do that. You will just be doing that because you do not have the end in mind. And I really learned that lesson. And that was a, I wouldn't say it's a painful lesson, but that was really a life lesson that God taught me. All right. And the Bible already showed us a very small words, so sorry. But now mind, in Matthew chapter 24, God tells us we are living the end times. All right. There will be rumors of wars. All right. There will be nations rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines. There will be pestilence, which is like a pandemic. There will be earthquakes. And the love of many, many Christians, the love will grow cold. And I know after COVID, really, a lot of our friends, the love has also gone cold. Uh, cold. Uh, and people around me that I know. And I pray that I, I'm not one of them. And I fervently pray that we will all sustain the love for God. We do not need to say much. Recent earthquake in Turkey just wipe out 50,000 people overnight. All right, we are living in the end times, but how are we living in the end times? Um, how do we live our lives? All right, um, I shared this long ago before, but recently God began to remind me a bit more about one of them, and I thought today I'd just like to study in detail one of them. Uh, in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 24, God began to describe how the end will look like, and He began after that immediately He shared with us four parables the parables of the servant, the parables of the ten virgins, parables of talents and ships and goats, to signify that He's going to return. Jesus Christ is going to return as a master, as a bridegroom, and as a king. And uh, God recently has been speaking to me, ponder a bit more, and today I'd just like to focus on three parables on the returning of the master. And these three parables are taken from Matthew chapter 24, 25, and Luke chapter 12. All right? When I send this stack of slides to Yen, Yen said, you sure you can finish? <laughs> So I say, okay, I will speak very fast. So pardon me if I'm like a super bullet train. But I thought the three parables must be shared together to give you and give all of us a complete picture. All right, the first parable. All right, are we ready to learn from a parable? Yeah? Amen. All right, or you can turn into a Bible, but uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 45 to 51. All right, I'm going to read this parable. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master when comes will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over his, th- his goods. All his goods, sorry. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking at him for at the hour that he's not aware of and he will cut, into, cut him into two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So over here we have a wise Faithful and wise servant, and we also have an evil, uh, evil servant. When a master returns, it signifies when Jesus Christ comes again. He wants to look for the faithful and wise servant. Now, the wise servant discharged his duty faithfully. All right? The master leaves for a faraway place and says, Hey, take care of everything in my house. All right? Make sure everybody has food to eat. Everything is run after my garden. All the plants don't die. Okay, fine. All right? So he made sure he gives them all the food. It signifies that he takes good care of whatever the master has placed in his hand. He is a good steward. A good steward. But he knows that this belongs to the master. It does not belong to him. All right? So a wise servant discharged his duties faithfully. So I begin to read this and ask, what is in my hands? What has God placed in our hands? What is there in your hands? Give you three seconds to think. All right. Our pre-believing friends is in our hands, right? Their salvation is in our hands. Pray for them. That's something we can do. That is part of what God has placed in our hands. Our children, our parents, our spouse, our relatives, our career, your job, your time your money, your treasures, your giftings and your talents. All these are in our hands. And what the master wants is for us to be a good steward 
take good care of all these things while the master is away. So all these things are not yours, are not mine, are not ours, but it's temporary given to us so that we can take good care of them. May the Lord grant us wisdom this evening. How, Lord, search my heart, teach us, Lord, how can we really take good care of all these things while we are away before your second coming? And the wise servant has a heart of expectancy. He awaits, he awaited for his servant, uh, his master, sorry. And when, the, and when the master comes, the Bible says, he will find him so doing, which means he's faithful all the way to the end until the master comes. And I pray that, Lord, may all of us not dwell in our past. You say, Lord, I was faithful when I was a teenager. I was serving in teens while I was on fire for you, Lord. But now, not so. But the Bible says, we must be faithful till He comes. And when Master comes, He wants to find us so doing. Not something that we have done 30 years ago, or 5 years ago, or even 3 months ago. Let us stay faithful. And this is also a reminder to you and to myself, that may we all pray fervently and be always watchful that we will be found faithful till the Master returns. And the Bible called him faithful and wise. I was wondering, why, why go and add a wise? Faithful, say faithful, all right? Why add a wise? All right? Wise? Why wise? All right? Then I began to realize that in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, it mentioned this wise servant again. Because in the book of Daniel, Chapter 12 is the time where Daniel prophesied on the future, when the second coming of the Lord. He says, The multitudes who sleep in the dust, those who have you know, died of the earth, will awake again. You know? We will all resurrect again. This is what we, are, we all know, the second coming of Christ. Some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And this is the part where the wise servant comes. He says, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of heavens. Amen. Amen. The wise servant, those who are wise, the wise servant will shine like the brightness of heaven. Amen. And let us, let us strive and say, Lord, I want to be that faithful and wise servant that you talk about because I like to shine like brightness of heaven. And the master also called him blessed. Not only call him three, call him three names, are faithful, uh, call him wise, and call him blessed. And this word blessed is the same word used when Jesus used on Servant on the Mount, which uh, in Greek is called maka, Makarios. Okay, I'm very, not very good at it. But it's Makarios, what does it mean? It means that he will, it's not, it does not mean that he will be blessed. Sometimes we say, oh, the master come and because he did well, so the master will bless him. It's not true. The real meaning of Makarios means he is already blessed, which means when we are faithful on earth, while we are faithful on earth, we are starting to enjoy we already started to enjoy the blessing. We are already blessed when you are faithful on earth. Not wait till oh, Jesus come again and then Jesus look at you and say, oh, you are so faithful. Now you are blessed. No, it's not like that. It means that when we start to be faithful on earth, the moment you start to live a faithful life, you are blessed. You are blessed with the benefits originating from God. What a wonderful promise of God. Amen. So let us be transformed and understand that this blessing starts right now, starts immediately when we are faithful. All right? And uh, he's invited now, not just to rule over the household, but he will rule over all things. Now goes beyond the house, right? It originally, it's just rule over the house, right? Everything, the plants, the pigs, maybe the dogs, maybe the, the children, but now beyond. Everything that the master owns, everything, maybe his business, his his, uh, his uh, uh, venture, right? Everything that he owns, everything now, rule it, rule it with him. And this Bible always tells us, I think in our church, we preach it very often, in 3, 2, 1, right? We say, the overcomer will reign with Christ, right? So we, we all don't just want to be merely safe. We want to reign with Christ one day. We strive to be overcomer. And the Bible says, those whoever can be trusted a little, um, Whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. And 2 Timothy says, those, if we endure, we will also reign with Him. So we pray that, Lord, this is our desire. When you come again, the end in mind, right? I started by sharing, say, let's have an end in mind. What is the end that we want? We want to reign with Christ. Amen. 
Amen. Tell the one next to you, I want to reign with Christ. So the characteristic of the wise servant, the posture, the posture is that he has a heart of expectancy. He knows that master is returning and he expects the master to return anytime. He's eager, he's ready, and that is his posture. His focus is not what I want, but what the master wants. And what's the, what does the what master want? The master wants him to be a faithful steward. Everybody say faithful steward to be faithful with what God has placed in our hands. Everything that we see in our hands right now, the moment you open your eyes, you look at your ceiling, you look at the lights, you look at your wife, you look at your children, everything belongs to God and we are called to be a steward. And of course, there are so many lessons we can learn. How to be a good father, how to be a good husband. May the Lord help us, right? There's no one-size-fits-all lesson to teach every one of us, but we will all learn as we go. Walk with Christ. Amen. And the Bible tells us that this faithful servant, he called him faithful, wise, and he's blessed. Three things. And he invites him to rule over all things. All right. The evil servant is a scoffer. All right. That means he doesn't really believe that the master will come again. He says, my master will delay his coming. All right. Because in Second Peter, it says, in the last days, scoffers will come. All right. Scoffers means people who actually laugh at the idea that Jesus Christ is coming. He will say, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our ancestors died, right? Everything goes on as it has been, right? Since the Bible creation. And sometimes I also think like that. I say, Jesus Christ is coming, really? You tell me later? Hmm, I, I'm not so sure. All right, sometimes we fall into the scoffers. We, do, we think Jesus Christ is really coming? Not too sure. We do, do we have a heart of expectancy like the faithful servant? Sometimes I must admit that I do not at all, all right? But the evil servant even begin to beat his fellow servants. He now wants to take over the rightful place of the master. Who can beat servant? Of course, we are not supposed to be, uh, we're supposed to be humane. Uh, right? I'm not advocating master beating servant, but in the past, the master did beat the servants. Only master has the right to do that. But as a fellow servant, when you start beating your fellow servant, what it signifies is, I want to take over the rightful place of my master. I want to take over my life. I want to govern my own life. So an evil servant says, I want to do whatever with my life. I don't want Jesus Christ to you know, come and tell me what to do. I am the owner of my life. And it begins to eat and drink with the drunkards and begin to have, become a lover of self, lover of pleasures. And the Bible says, mark this, that in the last days, people will be lover of themselves, lover of money. I skip a bit. Without self-control, we will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And this is all mentioned in the Bible. And this, we, are, we are living in a world, in an era that much the most entertained era ever that existed in the, in the whole entire hum, humanity. All right? The moment we wake up, the moment we take our handphone, the smartphone, everybody has a smartphone. Even my children know smartphone is so entertaining. Right? They get entertained the moment, everything. Even my, you know, I don't really like uh, allow my kids to use phone at all. So they end up just looking at the, uh, they have this smart screensaver. Even the screensaver entertains them because it's AI, right? So they roughly think what you like and then whatever you swipe is whatever you like, you know? We are living in a, enter, such an entertained time and may the love, love, um, wisdom of God help us to know that in the last days, may, not, may we not just focus on lovers, uh, uh, self-pleasure because that's what the evil servant is focusing whole day long. It's just about eating, drinking, marrying, making myself happy. It's all about self. No one can serve two masters. It's you either serve God or serve money, right? You cannot serve both God and money. And the Bible calls such a servant who wants to own their own life, wants to govern their own life, wants to seek self-pleasure and don't want to focus on what the master wants. He calls him evil and hypocrites and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hypocrites such as the last point of having a form of godliness but denying its power. When I read this, I always associate as hypocrites. Isn't it exactly what the Pharisees is all about? Having a form, outward form of godliness, but inner heart, the heart is not connected to God at all. They are not submitted to God, but outwardly, they, 
they come to church and express themselves. They are in the synagogue, the Pharisees. But our heart issue, no one can tell. Only you can know it. Only I can tell. Even if I'm standing on stage, am I fully submitted to the Lord? You, cannot, you can't tell. Maybe I'm not. Am I right? So only ourselves, we are the only one that is accountable and only we can talk to God and tell God our own heart's condition. So let us be open about it. And uh, the posture is of the evil servant. They do not expect the master to return. They are scoffers. They focus on self-pleasures. They want to take the rightful place of the master over their own lives. And they, are, they live their life based on earthly desires. Then the Bible called them evil and hypocrite. And they will be sent for eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. May the Lord help us. And as we move on to the second parable, the parable of the master and servant in Matthew chapter 25. In the next chapter after Matthew chapter 24, there was another parable. So I shall not read this, but we all know that there's this parable where the master is going to a faraway place. He gives one person five talents of gold, second one, two talents of gold, and the last one, one talent of gold. All right? So one, two, five. All right? So um, the Bible says the five talents of gold went to multiply it. All right? He went to trade, he wanted to do some trading. Five plus five, he had ten. Right? The two also traded and had two. Two plus two, four. The one, the one with only one talent dug the ground and hid it, hid the Lord's money. And when the master returned, the master said to the five and the two, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over many, few things that will make you ruler. Again, ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. But for the last one, the one talent, he said, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not uh, sown and gather where I have not scattered seeds. And then he took that one and gave it to the one with 10. Because 5 plus 5 is 10, he took from mine and gave it to 10. And um, when I was pondering, I began to ask, uh, how much is one talent of gold? All right. So I recently there's a hype, you know, there's a hype about chat GPT, right? right? Machine learning, AI. So yesterday I said, okay, I, I do use chat GPT recently. So I said, I'm going to ask chat GPT. So I asked chat GPT, how much salary is equivalent to one talent of gold in the Bible? All right. So chat GPT, blah, 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 right? And then machine learning tells me, all right, one talent of gold is approximately 6,000 6, denarius. So it's equivalent to 20 years of a skilled worker wages. I said, wow. So actually in my mind, the five to one, I always think the one are very poor thing. One, one small little girl, I walk around. No, it is 20 years of salary. Wow, 20 years of wages. All right, that, that is a lot. That totally blew my mind. The one who hide, dug the ground, he must have dig a grave, right? <laughs> but how to dig a ground that can hide so much, right? So he dug the ground, 20 years of salary, he hid it, right? But that gives me another perspective of the five and two. The five talents of gold is worth 100 years of salary. It literally means I should take away, run away from money and I don't need to work my whole life. Wow, I want to still be a servant, come on. Nobody in the right mind will want to be a servant. If the master lived with you 100 years of salary, would you still want to be a servant? I don't think so, I want to, right? But he is faithful, you see. He does not focus on his self-pleasure. May the Lord help us this evening. It's not about how we want to use it to entertain for our self-pleasure. Uh, even when he has 100 years of his salary with him, he chooses to do what his master wants, which is to be a fruitful steward. He traded it. He knew it's not his. You see, he has that concept. So he knows it's not mine. He traded it. He have 200 years of salary when the master is back. He says, Master, this is yours, not mine. These are yours. Amen. May the Lord help us transform our mind this evening to understand what God is trying to speak to us that we are just steward. We are just steward. Whatever you see in your hands, your diamond ring, whatever you can see right now, you are just a steward. We are just a steward, nothing else. Even if you have 100 years of salary, don't run away. Don't use it for self-pleasure because these are God's 
money or God's property and God, Lord, help me, Lord, to know how you want me to spend it for your glory. So why are we stewarding? Yes, all these things I shall not repeat, right? How much talents the servant receives is not so important because some of us, when we look around us, you can see that in the society, some are just given more, some are less. You know, some people are born privileged. All right, recently we talk a lot about privilege, right? Some people are just born with a lot of privileges in their life. They have a, they have a big start in life, all right? Uh, some people can't even afford kindergarten. Some children don't even go to school and start school only in primary one, seven years old. And the developing age is all missed out. Such as kids, how can they be level even ground, level ground, right? The starting line is different. So all of us are really given different compared to someone in a third world country, poor country, or someone in Malaysia or in other developed countries. Everyone is given different. However, the Bible is great and the Bible is telling us that no matter how much you have, I think there is something wrong with the alignment. Uh, basically, what I want to say is no matter whether you have five or two, as long as just be a fruitful steward, you get the same reward, the same praise. You good and faithful servant. Amen. And come and come into the joy of the Lord. So enter the joy of the Lord. You are invited to enter the joy of the Lord. And you will get that joy even while you are on earth. You don't need to wait till when Jesus comes again, when you meet Jesus again, then you will enter His joy. No, your joy starts now when you are a fruitful steward. And uh, Sometimes when I read this, I find it's very unfair. How come the master... So you have one person, five plus five, ten. Another one is two plus two, four. Another one is just one. Why would you take the one and give to the ten? Logically thinking, you should take to the one and give to the one with four. So a bit more, like balance five, five and then ten, right? So you have zero, five, ten, right? Why you want to give to the one with ten? Become eleven, then this person still four. The mathematics to me does, doesn't look fair. I say, if I'm the one with four, probably I'll complain. Hey, why you already got 10? You still give the one, become 11. You should give me. I only have four plus one, five. That's only fair, right? Don't you think so? I don't know, when I read Bible, I think like that. I think like a layman, right? Should be like that. But why isn't this guy complaining? Ah, because he knows. They know, they both know that it does not belong to them. So when you know that it does not belong to you, Master on the place there or place here, doesn't matter. It's still not ours. Do you understand what I'm saying? That is the attitude. And may God help us this evening that we know that it all doesn't belong to us. They, the, this parable is telling us the servants, these two servants know, they knew. It doesn't belong to them. They are just a steward. But the wicked and lazy servants, they knew. They knew. The Bible says the man is traveling to a far away country. So he knew that the master is going for some time, but he chose to do nothing. And then he said, I was afraid. So he's focusing on himself. He said, I was afraid. Huh? You punish me later, I lose your money. How? Right? 20 years of wages. I was afraid. But the Bible says, uh, tells us the master said, you knew. So you knew what kind of master I am. You knew that I reaped that I have not sown. Means you knew I want you to be fruitful, but yet you do not have the fear of the master. You do not have the fear of the God. You did not focus on what the master wants. You just focus on yourself. Say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. So I just hide it. And basically, the master is going for a far away place for a long time. A very long time. And yet, you hide 20 years of wages under the ground and did nothing. So what have you been doing all this time? I think for parents, you will totally understand, right? So imagine you have a primary school going kids. You say, hey, you have this, this, this homework. Huh? Your teacher asks you to do this homework. I'm going out giant to buy some things. I come back. Please make sure it's done. Then you go giant, and then you go pay your electricity bills. Then you really, ah, oh, today two hours. I think my son will probably finish at least some work. And go back home, he's playing computer games. How will you feel? You wicked son. No, nah, we won't say you wicked son. But we will be very angry, right? He's not, he's not focusing on what he needs to do, but he's just focusing on self-pleasure. Nothing else but just self-pleasure. So that is the... I feel, I, I don't know whether God feels that way, but I'm, I'm just trying to make it uh, more human fight a bit so that uh, I can understand and appreciate the Bible sometimes. 
Um, so the characteristic of a good and faithful servant, the attitude, the posture is, again, expect the return of the master. All right, focus on what the master wants and not your own self-pleasure and be a good steward over the things in your hands and you will be called a good and faithful servant, rule over all the things, many things, and now he can enter the joy of the Lord. And to me, the enter of the joy of the Lord, enjoying the joy of the Lord is called blessed, right? It's the same, makarios, right? So I, I think these two parables, I draw a lot of alignment. I begin to see so many similarities uh, from all these parables. And the wicked servant, they are lazy, even though they knew that they had a lot of time in hand, but they just say, I'm afraid. I'm just focusing on myself. I'm very afraid to try this, try that. I don't want to try my talents. I don't want to try my giftings. I don't want to touch this. I don't want to do that. Focusing on self, but not what God wants, not what the Master wants. And may the Lord help us uh, not to be a wicked and evil servant. Right? And the last one, uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 35 to 38. All right. Um, let us read together, shall we? We have been very quiet. Okay. If you can see, read. Like, if you cannot see, then you hear us. Ready? One, two, three. Let your ways be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourself be like men who wait for their masters. When he will return from the wedding, then when he comes and knocks, he may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you, he will gird himself and have him sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. Wow. Okay, and I can finish it. And if he should come in the second watch and come in the third watch and find him so, blessed are those servants. For know this, that if the master of the house have known the hour of the thief will come, he will have watched and not allow uh, the house to be broken in full. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at the hour do not expect. And this parable is also, master and servant is also talking about the end times, the second coming of Christ. So you can see similarities, right? The three parables, master and servant is all about master returning and it's very clear to us in the Bible, it's not ambiguous at all that it is about the second coming of Christ and it's about the end times. And what is, get, let your ways be girded. Uh, let your ways be girded is in, in the past when people are girded, Good their ways is where they are prepared. They are prepared to labor. They are prepared to travel to the next destination. They are prepared to walk, right? Because of their, their ropes, it's very hard to walk, right? So let your ways be good. They are prepared to, to walk and travel and, and do some hard labors, maybe carry luggages or whatever, or, 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 or slash the, the wilderness, you know? He knows he's not staying put permanently. So this way, this servant knows that I'm not going to stay put for long. It's ready, always ready, girded, right? I'm sure for us who are working, we put on these nice working clothes. The moment we go home, wow, the first thing I want to do is take off my socks, change your comfortable clothes because cannot a like, whole day already like that, right? No, I need to make sure I'm comfortable when I'm at home. But no, uh, even at home, they are not comfortable, right? They already got themselves, all right? Uh, it reminds me of the Passover, right? This is how they celebrate the Passover. Um, because the Passover, the very next day when they, after the Passover, they want to leave Egypt, right? Am I right? The Passover. And therefore, um, this is the rule uh, for them uh, when they celebrate Passover. And thus, you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and stuff in your hand. And so you shall eat in haste. Okay, quickly, gobble down. It's the Lord's Passover. And the... A, a, a good steward or a good servant has this attitude that I do not belong here. You know, this world is not our home. We are here just temporarily. Our average age is 80 plus. All right. Uh, I think Malaysia, I think it's 80 for men. I don't know about that. This world is not our home. We are just passing by. We will all leave this world one day, including myself. Right? Some live earlier, some live later. But this world is not our home. And we need to make sure we are girded. Our waist is girded, ready. Right? We are, we're going to eat in haste. Right? We get ready. The standards on our feet, anytime we are ready to go. So that is the attitude of a good servant. He knows that this world is not our home. Everybody tell the one next to you, this world is not my home. And let your lamps be burning. 
It's interesting. Every time when we say lamps burning, we think of the ten virgins, the parable of the ten virgins, right? The ten virgins, some have the lamps uh, ready with oil, the other one don't have oil, right? But actually, there is a similar parable that talks about lamps burning too. And the lamp signifies the relationship with God. You know, it's very difficult to light a lamp at night. If it's already dark, how are you going to pour oil and still light the lamp? It's difficult. You, in the first place, you don't have light to even see at night, right? So you must keep your lamp burning. Get yourself ready. Your relationship with God must be continuous, right? So keep your lamp burning. Keep your relationship going with God. And, uh, and the Bible says, when the master returns, he knocks on the door. And it's interesting, he says, open to him immediately. So what does it tell us? That this servant has a heart of expectancy. He's expecting. It's almost like, you know, though, you know I always come back to work. Uh, my three, three girls, right? Every time when my, my, my uh, keys, right? Just enter the metal, the metal gate. I have a metal door. First one is a metal door. So it makes some sound. First thing, before I even turn, my, my girls, usually one of them already open. Ah, Papa, you're back. So heart of expectancy. They already know, right? Around that time, right? Evening time, I will be back. All right, the heart of expectancy of this servant. And uh, master call him blessed. It's the same word again. It's makarios. It means he was already blessed. Even before the master returned, when he was still in the house, getting ready, he was already blessed. He's not blessed because he opened the door quickly. No, he was already a blessed with many blessings originated from God. Amen? And uh, sorry, the alignment went off. Uh, but one, one, one of the interesting part uh, before I end this sermon uh, is this. A lot of times when you look at the parable of the master and servant, it's like the master is like, wow, I don't know, is it very just or very, uh, how do you put it? Like, um, just come and be a judge like that. Right? Come back, uh, uh, good, faithful, one side. Uh, evil, ah, gnashing of teeth, right? Seems to give us that impression that, oh, wow, this master, like, just, it's just about judge, judging people. Huh? Like, not very loving. But when I read this, and recently I was reminded uh, by another sermon about this, I say, hey, this really transformed my mind. You know what the master did? Uh, I see whether I can... Uh, okay, yeah, maybe we use this. Okay, so it says that... Uh, in fact, the second one, it says the master might return in the second watch or third watch of the night. Third watch is between midnight to 3 a.m. So it says the master returned from a wedding. It could be second watch or third watch. He said, wow, come on. How, how do you return from a wedding midnight, 12 to 3 a.m.? Right? Probably the master will, maybe their wedding celebrate for many days and the master will say, halfway through, you leave the wedding. So the master withdrew himself halfway through and then came and knocked on the door. And when he found his servant, opened the door, he actually sit him down and the original word is recline them down, let them sit comfortably and the master come and serve them food. So why is the master returning? The master is returning to have fellowship. The master wants to return not because the master is eager to come and catch them by surprise. Ha ha, you didn't do it well. You wicked evil servant. No. The master's desire why is the master desiring to come back? He come back to spend time with the servant. When he opens, he knocks the door and the servant allows him to enter the house. He recline him down and he come and serve him food. He says the master girded himself. Now the master began to prepare food. Prepare, right? Gird himself, sit them down and come and eat with them. And the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears, my voice and opens the door. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. That is the heart of the master. So let's not walk away thinking of these three parables. Say, wow, this God, uh, so judgmental. Just want to come, make sure I'm faithful, fruitful. No. Yes, he has an expectation. He has an expectation for us to be faithful, to be fruitful, to not call this world our home. Yes. Because our home is in eternity with Him. 
and he wants to spend that relationship with him. So the master is here, is returning to spend time. He wants to have deep fellowship with us. So from the parable, we know that, you know, let's have the heart of expectancy. Let's make sure our lamb is burning. We have that relationship with God. And we know that this world is not our home. And we will be called blessed. We will be called blessed. And in the end, the master, we want, we, we will enjoy that close fellowship with Christ because the master is returning because he wants to serve you and I food. He wants to set a table. The Bible in some says, I want to set a table before your enemies. I want to set a table for you. Amen? Hallelujah. So let me just summarize the three parables. I, I find similarities. I find the, the uh, close alignment. That Let us pray that our heart will have a heart of expectancy to expect the return of the masters. A good and faithful servant knows that this world is not my home. I'm here temporarily, right? I'm going to make sure my waist is girded. I'm ready to leave. Wherever God calls me, I will go. I'm ready to labor for God. And everything that is in my hands is not mine. I'm just a steward. I want to be faithful. Even if you have given me 100 years of my wages, I will not take and run away. I will be here to faithfully serve you. Amen. I will not be lazy and wasteful. Amen. And the Bible says, you are faithful, you are wise, you are blessed, you are good. And Master will want to have a good relationship, a good fellowship when he returns. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I finished all of them on time, roughly, right? Shall we all stand? <laughs> Hallelujah. But I, I feel that the Lord is speaking to our hearts, including mine. Um, I don't know which part speaks to you, but I, I thought, let's not leave this place without talking to God. So shall we just spend some time just at your own place? Um, just begin to talk to God. Just tell Him what you think about the sermon, which part speaks to you. Is the part that, you know, Lord, help me to be a faithful steward, Lord. You can tell Jesus, Lord, help me to have the heart of expectancy to be prepared for your second coming, to be ever ready. Oh Lord, help me to make sure I, my ways are girded so that I'm not here to stay. This, this world is not my home. Help me, Lord, not to be so comfortable in this world because this is just a temporary passing through. Hallelujah. Uh, let's spend the next two minutes. Just talk to God. Oh, hallelujah. We have a loving Father. We have a loving Master. This Master is not here to judge us, but He's here to help us to be an overcomer. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says, His delay is coming not because he is because he's patient. He does not want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to be saved. That's why he's delaying his, his coming. He's patient, he's merciful, he's loving, and he wants to come. He wants to come to spend that close fellowship with us. Jesus wants to come to serve you food. He wants to come and enter into your house. But firstly, you must open that door. And I want you to really open up quickly. Open the door quickly to Jesus tonight. When Jesus is knocking on your door right now, and if you have not accepted Christ, or if you are half-hearted, I want you to quickly open up your heart and say, Jesus, I receive you. Come into my life. Come and eat with me. Come and enter and serve food to me. Hallelujah. And for some of us, the Lord is speaking to us and saying, you know, this word, this word is not our home. You know, help us, Lord, to be a good and faithful servant, to be a good steward. Even if I have 100 years of salary, oh God, Lord, it is still not mine. 
Open up my eyes tonight, Lord. Father, I just pray for all of us tonight that may your word come like a double-edged sword that will pierce through our hearts and may land on good ground, oh God, that we will understand your expectation, that we will understand your heart, that we know your nature, that your nature is a loving father, your nature is a loving master, uh, one that is patient and merciful and loving, Lord. You are not here to judge us, but Lord, you desire all of us to be faithful. You desire all of us to be good, to be wise, and you want to reign with us in eternity. So Father, I just hand all our lives onto your hand. I just pray that you come and help us to live wisely in these end days, for we know your coming is soon. And help us to have that heart of expectancy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.